Welcome to the Parenting with Confidence podcast. I am your host, Teresa Alexander Inman, board certified behavior analyst and infant toddler developmental specialist. So I am just honored to have again with us Nathaniel Turner. Um, we ha- he's been on before talking about you know how to help propel children into their destiny and how we how parents can help create that for them. And um, I just want to read a little bit about Nate right now. Um, he is a human committed to living with joy on purpose, on purpose, and helping, serving, and making sure everyone knows their life matters. That is such a powerful statement. Thank and, you. You know, oh, I don't. I don't. Maybe I wasn't supposed to speak yet. <laughs> but yes, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I just tend to, you know, I just tend to go on because no, no. you know my excitement just. <laughs> it, it, it's all good. Um, yeah, that's 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 the goal. When I when I'm when my time is up, I I like to know that I made some meaningful contribution to the planet. So awesome yeah. and. You know, I appreciate that because I I believe that we're all here to accomplish something. You know, we're not just here for ourselves. We're here to help somebody else, to bring somebody up, to empower somebody, to teach whatever it is our gifts are, whether that gift is, you know, learning how to grow something Mm -hmm. or to sow something, you know, we should help somebody else with that. Somebody who may have, you know, similar goals and plans and skills and talents, um, or interests, you know, help them in those areas, help hone those skills. Agree. So I'll say the, the quickly, the, and I would say I agree with you, and 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 more than agree with you, that is an impetus for a lot of the things that that I do. Um, I, I I mentioned before I'm a guy from Gary, um, with a and I say a tumultuous um, relationship with my father a somewhat challenging background, although challenges are relative, but I I would not be here with you today if it hadn't been for people making the decision for whatever reason to just in some ways adopt me and make and give to me. And those people are gone, I can't give back to them. I can't, there's nothing I could do. I can't give them any money. I can't take them to dinner. One, one of the five people are still alive but there's nothing I can do for them other than give generously the way that they gave to me. That is beautiful, right? And it's, and again, it's what we're here. I believe it's what we're here on earth to do. So you mentioned five people. So you're referring to your starting five. They were my starting five before I knew that I had a starting five. So, yeah. So uh, my, into my sophomore year in high school, my father said to me, you have, in, th- in two years, you have three decisions to make, or you have to choose between three things. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, what does that mean? He said, you have to move out and get your own job and get your own place. Okay. You have to join the military. You can go to the military, but you know how I feel about a black, these are, these are his words, you know how I feel about the bl- a black man in the military. I was in there. You have no business being there. Okay. And he said, or you can go to college. Now, I was a C student at, at best. Like that's, that might be better than I actually was. My high school guidance counselor the same semester said to me, the best I could hope to do was join the military. So here, here's this kid with this father who's given him this mandate, but with no instructions. I have no idea how I'm supposed to do this. Mm-hmm. I've got a, a guidance counselor who tells me the best that I could hope to do is join the military. He didn't mean it as an officer, right? So I'm like, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And I was fortunate enough to have a few friends whose parents, who, who I would go over their homes, and I was always more interested in talking to adults than to children. So when I would visit my friends, one of my friend, his father's name, it was, he's deceased, Judge Kimbrough. I could ask him, well, how did you become a judge? He said, I went to Fisk University, and then I went to law school at John Marshall in Chicago. So then instantaneously now I have have a school 
in mind. Okay, my dad said I got to go to college, so I got to go to I got to figure out how to get to Fisk. That's all. I, that's all I thought about. Okay, now I got to figure out how to get to Fisk. So then you go to the guidance counselor and you say, well, what are the requirements for Fisk University? That's all I know, and I'll figure out John Marshall after I get to Fisk and get a degree. His wife, uh, James's uh, Kimbrough, Judge Kimbrough's wife's name was Faye. Faye was a math teacher, so she was my math teacher, my geometry teacher. So I got to know her. Um, my business teacher, her name was, is Charlene Turner. Her daughter Michelle was my classmate. People thought she was my sister. Whenever we would show up in the class, Michelle would be sitting in front of me or to my left, and I would be Nate. So M and N, and Michelle adopted me as her brother took me home to meet her family and they adopted me too. So suddenly I had a father, Grant, and I had a mother, uh, Charlene. I had this inspirational couple that looked like the Huxtables, the, the judge and his wife with the master's degree and who she was the math teacher. And then I met a gentleman by the name of Frank McKinney, who was a police officer who not only taught me about why I need to stay out of trouble, but was also an entrepreneur, owned a, a liquor store, a, a lounge, a restaurant, and on every Saturday I would work with him. So suddenly I had these five people that became pillars in my life to help me to figure out how to do what my father didn't think I could do and how to do what my guidance counselor didn't think I could do. Wow, that is amazing. And you know, that's, you know, cause people talk, you know, people think, and in my head, when you said, you know, starting five and, you know, I'm thinking, okay, these influential people, how does the, you know, the average person meet those people? But your teacher, your, you know, those people are here. Yep. You don't yep. have to make any extra efforts to meet them. <laughs> just, yep. you know, just get, just tap into the people who are already right. in your circle. Right. You have to avail yourself to that. So when I, so now when families ask me, well, I said, you know, those were, that was my starting five, but I didn't know if those before I knew anything about building a network. Today, what the 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 talents that I know that are needed, I know exactly what they are. So if if Teresa, you said, well, what do I do for myself for starting five? I'd say, okay, well, first of all, you need somebody that knows how to point you where you want to go. In other words, you have a north star. Do you know what the north star is? And you're like, well, you probably say, yeah, absolutely. You say, I know what the north star is. But I said, you remember Harry Tubman? Uh, help slaves get to freedom from a North Star. So here's someone again with no skills, no ability to read a map, none of that. It's figured out that I can follow this star and this other astrological stuff. I can figure out how to get to freedom. Well, you need someone in your life who can help you get freed. Somebody who's probably been freed themselves. They've been in trials and tribulations themselves and they can show you a pathway to get there. That You need that person in your life. Okay, then you need somebody in your life that is not going to tell you that impossible exists they're going to always tell you impossible is nothing because you're going to doubt enough for everybody yes. that you don't need somebody else joining you with doubt. So do you know somebody like that? Right, we're going to think about that. Then there's somebody you know that's meticulous with detail. They, they Every time you're at the house, they're always cleaning. Their clothes are, are in color codes. Right? There's somebody you know that's like that. You need that person in your life. There's a person in your life who you know that will not take no for nothing. You can go in the store with them. They don't like the way they've been served. They got, they got to see a manager. Everything like that, you need that. And then you need someone. It could be a person in the church, but somebody you know who just knows a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that, that I call Pops, and we call him the mayor because he just knows everybody. Hey, Pops, do you know so? Oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. Could you, could you make an introduction? That's it. I just need you to make an introduction. Um, and so that that becomes the, the, the components of the starting five. Uh, that's amazing. And thank you for making it, again, you know, everyday people that we can meet and, sure. and yeah. have access to instead of, because in my head, I remember when I started on my journey of um, self-improvement, you know, like, well, you're the average of the five people that you, you know, you freak, you hang out with the most. And I'm like, oh gosh, um, I don't know anybody, you know? <laughs> And, yes. you know, and I remember one of them saying, start with me. It's like, mm -hmm. yes, you're not, we're not going to hang out, but you know, you have my material, you've got my books, you've got, you know, use me as your mentor, even though you can't call me and say whatever, but you know, like, you know, podcast, watch my podcast, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. wherever you see my materials, 
you know, get to know me. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And then, so now you have me as your mentor, then mm -hmm. who else, you know? And it's just amazing because I've been learning a lot about, you know, being on vi certain vibrational levels. And when you put yourself in a certain vibrational level, it's like you just start meeting people. You're like a magnet to meeting the people who you want to meet. Yeah. So I've met some super amazing people. I mean, who would have thought that I would be sitting here with you today? No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Hey, I'm going to tell you, raise your bar, but I, pre oh, <laughs> I, I, pre I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, it. so it's just amazing, you know, what happens when we just do that. And, and all it takes is changing your mindset. Yeah. I mean, and what I would also say that today it is much easier to meet people. Now, maybe not building lasting relationships, but you, it's much easier to reach to, to meet people. And I would also say sometimes you might not have the ability to have a conversation directly with someone. So people have asked me, um, well, who's in your starting five? And, and I've said to people at times, there are people who I don't know, but because I have the ability to go listen to what they might have said on a particular subject or read what they said, it is for me equivalent to having a conversation with them. Absolutely. I would love to pick up the phone and talk to Cornell West. I would love to pick up the phone and have a conversation with Malcolm X. I'm, I'm, I'm probably equally likely to have a conversation with Malcolm as I am with Cornell, who's still alive. Yeah. But the point of it is, I, I can see what they would have thought on a particular subject. I can, if I want to have the oratory abilities of Cornell West, I can just watch Cornell West yeah. speak time and time again right and so if i wanted to match malcolm's intellect i could just study what malcolm studied or read the books that malcolm read i may not master i may not you know match him completely but i but there is a potential for me to learn to be better i just feel like oftentimes we look for the excuses rather than for the solutions and the solutions are like the air molecules they're everywhere Amen. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to just point people to your website because if they want to learn more from you and get to know you and have you as their mentor, they can go to NathanielAturner.com. That's correct. Um, so please, people, you know, again, because I've, I've, I've done it and I learned, you know, going onto your website and, you know, people, because People, I've read you, you know, some of your blogs and I've learned from that. So you don't have to go, you know, cause be like, oh, well, they probably charge this much for that or whatever. You can get free material, you know, if that's, you know, if you're not able to or willing to pay for it, right. to invest in yourself, I shouldn't say pay for it, to invest in yourself. Because if you want that pair of shoes or to get your nails done, you're going to find the money to do that. To do that. Yeah. But, you know, for go getting your nails done for a couple of weeks, I'm just saying, mm -hmm. put that money together <laughs> and learn and, you know, get in touch with somebody who can actually help you get to that level because your children are going to become who you are. They're going to, because they'll see what you're doing and they'll learn from you. They will imitate your behavior. So if the one of the best ways to empower your children is to empower yourself. Yep, and I'm just going to say it again, NathanielAturner.com. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're, you're very kind. You're very kind. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, listen, I I want people because we're here because we want to help people. Yeah, absolutely. Right? absolutely. And that's one of the ways that we can help them right now. You yeah. know, everybody has a phone. Everybody has you know access to the internet. Otherwise, they would not be here right now. And um, you know, learn some more. Go a little deeper. Yeah, yeah. you you made a comment about the um, our willingness to do the hair and the nails and the shoes, and I get it. Right? I do get it. I get. I understand that in the society that we live in, there's a tendency to be driven by immediate gratification. That is the thing that proves, in many cases, for people who feel unseen, that we actually exist. If I can walk around with an expensive pair of shoes, you see the shoes, which means that you now see me, or the purse, or the hair. I, like, I completely get it. But I also understand that those are short term, and that's not, that's only a, a, like a quick caption of who you are and that's not all that you want to be which is why if I came back to the very beginning why it's so critical for you to have these really audacious hopes and dreams because you couldn't have only hoped to, to get your hair done you couldn't have only hoped to have a nice pair of shoes there had to be something bigger and you need something bigger in order to find a way to not be caught by doing only the little stuff like 
you need to have the, the North Star. So for me, my journal, my journal becomes part of the North Star. My vision board becomes part of the North Star. I tell people all the time, there's two stars that you have to be to acknowledge. There's the North Star that helps you to get to where you want to go. And you got to create that North Star. And then there's the Death Star that you don't have to do nothing because it's coming. It's looking for you. There is the, if you're a Star Wars fan, you know the Death Star appears out of nowhere and and demolishes everything in its sight. Well, there's that. That that part is going to show up unless you have some intentionality about going to the North Star. Absolutely. And you know, and I'm just gonna quote my husband who always reminds me that if you're not growing, you're dying. Yeah. So if you're not going towards that North Star, you're going towards the Death Star. And right. what would you have said? Like, you know, um, somebody said to me too the other day, if you know, whatever it is that you want to do, even if you're afraid, do it anyway. Do it with your knees shaking. You know, that came from my friend, Brittany. Do it with your knees shaking because then your knees are only going to shake like maybe the first time or the first couple of times. Then you build that muscle memory mm -hmm. and it becomes a thing. Like I've been doing this podcast. I thought about it and I was like, but who am I, how am I ever going to get anybody on my podcast? Who's going to want to talk to me? Do I have enough content on my own to make it interesting and to teach people and to help people? And, but you know what? I started it. Right, right. You know, a couple of friends said they were going to, you know, it's like, let's do this. We talked about doing a podcast together and they, you know, where are they? Right. Yeah. It never happened. So it's just like, listen, I'm tired of waiting for people. I just have to do this myself. And I went ahead and did it. And here I am. And um, I have guests. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we started talking about children. Again, children are the best example of that. Yes. You know, I, 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 my, as I remember my son as an, as an infant laying on his back, right. Or laying on his sides. Cause you're worried. I think about Sid or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then one day I come in the bedroom and he's pulled himself up. I'm like, Oh my God. And so to your point, how does a child who's never stood stand up and not be afraid of standing? Exactly. How does a child who then when you take out the crib and turns over and starts crawling, then they eventually starts to try to stand and walk and falls down and gets up and tries it again. How do they do that without being right, being worried about fear? So if a child, an infant, and when a child is doing that, you don't say, hey, stay down, stay down. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like, You'll never on, get that on. walking thing, forget it. <laughs> right, but when it's us, again, as an adult, all of that wonderful stuff about in our in our infancy that makes us who we are, we forget it. Yes. It's all there. It's all there. But dare I say, though, it's because of the adults in our lives who, you know, all of a sudden they're looking at real world and it's like, oh, no, you'll never be able to do that. You can't do that. That yeah. is not possible. Correct. Yeah. You know, but they're the same people who read the Bible and say, with God, all things are possible. Yeah. But no, this one, baby, mm -mm, you'll yeah. never be able this to. You'll never. Right. You, you exactly. know? <laughs> and I'm like, OK, I'm not even going to listen to you. I'm just going to watch the children. I'm just going to exactly. watch the, the children because they fall and get up and they fall and they get up i remember my son we could not teach him to walk but he could run it's the craziest thing he would run and put his hands out to the wall and put his hand on the wall and sit down i was like this is this boy is crazy so i this first pair of shoes were a pair of track shoes we take him to the track we were while i was working at purdue university we take him to the track and run laps with him because we couldn't he couldn't walk he would just run and when we would jog we turn around and he run back the other way with us. And then the next person will run and they turn around and he goes back. <laughs> wow. And you know, which is awesome because then too, you're allowing him to operate where he is yep. instead of no, well, no, no baby walk, you know, right. this, no, let's, what, let's focus on what our child's gifts are and help to hone those instead of try to mold them into what you want them to be or what you think they should be, mm -hmm. which of course, later in life, you know, because they're trying to be what you want them to be, then they're not meeting their purpose. So then you're going to end up doing what? Maybe nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and not reaching their potential. He's still running. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do. You, we can't walk. Nope. Nope. Hey, I need to do this. When I, I'm going, I need to go to Brazil, dad. I need to 
I need to chase my dream plan. Dude, but I, I lead a country. How am I supposed to get you out? Of the, I don't know. I don't know. But you got to figure it out. You, yeah. you, you got to figure it out. Okay. I'm back now. I got a concussion. I got to go to college now. I got to get accepted to these schools. And when I when I get to school, I got to get my PhD. So whatever school I go to, got to prepare me. I got to go straight through and get, like, go straight through and get your PhD. What are you talking about? Now he's in his fifth year of his, PhD, his, yeah. uh, his PhD program. He's yeah. always running. Awesome. Well, because again, you allowed him to be yeah. and within, you know, within certain boundaries and guidelines that kept him safe. Right. And, and provided him run. with, pardon? And then he made me run. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll teach us. We'll learn from them. I, you know, I always told my kids, you know, I'd like, thank you for teaching me that. And my older son, this is his art. He would be like, but mom, you're, um, you're my mom. I said, yes. And I learned from you and Lee, like mm -hmm. Lee's his brother, my younger mm -hmm. son. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot tell you how much I've learned from you guys. I'm here to teach you, but I'm also here to learn from you because I want to know how to be the best mom for you. And right, only you right. can teach me that. Right. Yeah, no, the best relationships are certainly reciprocal. I've always say that the hand muscles was a very interesting way to look at reciprocity. The hand, the muscles in the hand move the very same way for receiving and giving. Mm -hmm. If there's something in your hand you want to give, you have to open it like that. Absolutely. If there's something in your hand you want to receive, you have to open it. And so the the muscles are the same. I'm like, so you have to give and receive in the same fashion. So give it away. And don't worry. We'll come back. Absolutely. You give freely, receive freely. Yeah. Um, and I want to, you made me remember something. I actually, okay. was list, I did a course with Marissa Pierre. Um, she's a hypnotherapist. And she says, okay, breathe in okay. and hold it. So this is like you receiving. So hold it. If you, if you receive too much, it gets uncomfortable Absolutely. because you hold your breath and it gets uncomfortable. Right. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Then breathing out, it's like giving. Mm -hmm. That also, if you overdo it, gets uncomfortable. So we have to find that balance. Mm -hmm. of giving and receiving so that life can be, you know, so that we can reach the potential. We can be harmonious. We can have that joy, that intentional joy, you know, that joy on purpose that you talk about. Mm -hmm. It comes from that balance, I think. Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah I, I, I'd say to something similar to that, which is that I feel like life is like living, the best life is a life lived like a, a um, rain barrel with a spout. And so I have a friend, some friends who say to me sometimes, you, you're you going to burn yourself out. There's a point where you can't give anymore. And I'd say, well, maybe, maybe. But if 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 the creator gives something to me, it is not mine. Exactly. So if if it's poured into me, the only and I and, and I want something more then you know what I have to do, because you can't have a bucket full and put a top on it and expect to get something new. You gotta, you gotta pour it out. So I'm like, okay, the best lives are lives that don't have a cap on the bucket so that I can receive it, but also have a spout. So I'm not trying to hoard it. So you can give it, give it away. Cause once it's come through me, I've already known how to use it. Now I need to give it away to somebody else. I'll get more. I'm like, I'm not, I don't believe that I'm only gonna get a, a, a limited amount. That that seems counterintuitive with someone saying all things are possible for, right? Or right as a person thinking in their heart, so are they. Well, I, that can't be the case if I'm putting a cap on it. So I, I feel that way that we're all vessels that receive something, and the best we could hope to do is have a spout and give it away. Exactly. And um, how can parents teach their children that though? Um to do it so so you know here again most of the things i can tell you are tell you from example man i feel like that's the best example some years ago i had a good friend who i i believe took his life it's pretty clear he took his life um i was in a very long state of depression he and i shared the same birthday part of the same fraternity knew him for over 20 years in my wedding really good really good good friend of mine and I felt like I let him down, that somehow there's something I should have done. Everybody in my family told me to stop, to get over it. My birthday is July 15th. My son's birthday is June 27th. I would celebrate my birth son's birthday on June 27th. And on June 28th, depression would sit in. Mm -hmm. And by the time July 15th rolled around, 
there are times I literally couldn't, I shouldn't say literally, I could not get out of the bed. I said, you got to do something else. I got this child, he's watching me, and I'm not doing what I need to do. So I decided on my birthdays, what I would do is care for somebody else. Now, you can tell a child all the time, hey, you know, you got to care for other people. It's a whole nother thing when your your whole family goes with you and you buy greeting gift cards and you pass them out to people who are unhoused or who haven't had a meal and you go you go do that kind of stuff. Your, your child sees that. And my dad is doing stuff for people. You know, that wasn't the only time you saw it, but that became a ritual thing that we did every every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, everybody's birthday, every anniversary. Okay, we don't need, we, we don't have we don't need anything. Let's go celebrate somebody else on this day. That is so beautiful. And of course there are going to be people who say, Well, I don't have it to give. I'm the one waiting to receive it. But yeah. You know, you can give a meal to somebody. You can go, you know, help at a shelter. It doesn't cost money. You're not giving of, you know. You could just go. So I've had some of the best conversations I've I've had were with people who didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And what I what I found from them was that oftentimes they said, I just appreciate you seeing me as a human. So many people walk past me and look at me like I'm just, I want to be here. Some people, some people look past me and don't know my story. And so you just stand, you just talk to folks and you treat them like you would want someone to treat you if the shoe were reversed. It doesn't take any money to do that. That is true, exactly. And I, you know, I, I always like to come up with solutions for people because you know they're always the. But how about me? My story's this is different. La da 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 da. And I mean, a lot of times it's just excuses because yeah. the five dollars that you spent on whatever, you yeah. know, you could have done something different with it. You know, yeah. just um, again, you don't even have to spend any money. It's just it's right. just a matter. You could just go and 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 say hello just yeah. speak to people in a fashion that that makes them recognize that you recognize their humanity for me a lot of our problems exist because people don't feel seen mm -hmm. right That's true. you live in a we live in a world that only wants to see people if you have a whole lot of stuff right. i got a car if i'm famous oh let me see you on instagram you got 10 million followers you got 30 million followers but somebody else you know, well, who is Nate Turner? Why should we care about Nate Turner? Well, what's the difference between Nate Turner and Tony Robbins? I know Tony Robbins has a whole lot of people who follow him, but is Tony Robbins saying anything differently than my parents have been telling me or your parents told you I'm 56 for the last 56 years? Yeah. Absolutely, unequivocally not. Not. But because you, you've decided to attach value because of what someone has or wears or dresses or a production then you miss out recognizing that the people from all walks of life can add value to your life. Exactly. And, you know, when you honor those people, the people who are, you know, like you said, without, maybe they're on the streets, maybe they're homeless. When you honor them and treat them like human beings uh, and, you know, spend a moment, even if, like you said, just to say hello, your children notice that. Yeah, And absolutely. they start to honor those people. I remember my son when when my sons were younger, especially Dre, he loved Michael Jordan, and okay. I would tell him, "I want you to treat that person, the homeless person on the street, with the same reverence that you would Michael Jordan, because he is no better or worse than anybody. No, right. You know, he's his circumstances are different, but as a human being, um, you know, like somebody said, we're all a value of one. Doesn't matter what you have." We have all the same value. We're all as important as the other. So treat people with that respect. And again, when we model those behaviors, yeah. our children imitate them. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. If they don't see it, they're probably not going to. They're probably not going to be it. So yeah, it starts. Yeah. It starts with you. I know he's watching. I have a. I have a picture. When I think he was sixteen or seventeen, we decided to hop on a bus and I live here outside of Indianapolis and there's a mega bus and we decided to just get on the bus without knowing where we were going 
and just ride the bus until we got tired of riding the bus. So, so we rode the bus from here to Louisville, from Louisville to Nashville, from Nashville to Atlanta. Then we're like, oh God, we're sick of the bus. We got in the car and we drove to South Carolina and we came back. And on the way back, back through Nashville, we stopped and I have my cell phone and I'm taking a picture of him. And he has, he has a good, the really good camera and he's taking a picture of me. And I remember writing in, in a blog post that when you think you're watching your children, your children are watching you. Yeah. And their lenses are better than yours. And and so I'm, I'm mindful of that. And then as a, as like a two year old, he once was playing hide and seek, and he said, "Daddy, can you see me, Daddy? Can you see, Daddy? Can you see me, Daddy?" And I'm mindful that at all times your children are also are always wondering if you can see them. Now, not just your children, but somebody's child somewhere wants to know that child could be five to 95. They just want to know that somebody sees them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I can't think of a better way to end. (laughs) I mean, I don't know what I don't know where to go from here. (laughs) Don't go. That's fine. You can go to the end. That's all good. Oh my goodness, that was just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Because again, we everybody wants to be seen and it takes nothing to see somebody and acknowledge that you have seen them. Nope. Um, and you know, so often though, parents focus on the end goal instead of encouraging and seeing through the process. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to throw that in there because, you know, it's not about what your child is has become it's what they are becoming go through that journey with them encourage them through it praise them through it and like when they were babies if they fall just say hey you got this you can get up again you didn't just tell them oh stay down you'll never get this walking thing right no you You did it with a smile yeah you did it with a smile you might have got on the floor with them you may have given them a hug you're like hey this is this you can do this absolutely we we certainly have to continue to do that it, last thing I, I it, with, with our son we never called him any we called him our man in training so what I was to your point was always thinking about the man that I hoped he would become the the man that I'm I'm responsible for helping him become and I used to think about that as, as in thinking about um, old McDonald's farm so, and if you, you know, you, we started to sing on McDonald's farm, we said, when I had a, had some chicks and I'd say, well, what was on McDonald raising? You'd say chicken. If I said, on McDonald had some, um, some calves, I, you'd say, I say, what is on McDonald raising? You'd say steer or whatever, a cow. Hey, hey. But when you and I say about children, people say, well, we raising kids. We're raising, no, you're not. You're raising adults who will be productive citizens. And so, but part of it is is reforming how we think about what this responsibility we have. I'm not raising it. I just tell my friends, they're like, how's your little boy? I'm like, I don't have a little boy. Well, you, you and your wife just had a child. I said, I don't have a little boy. I have a man in training. They're like, but nay, he's not a man, but he's closer to being a man than he's ever going to be a uh, an infant so so why why would I ever talk about raising him to be something that I don't want him to be and he and have him confused he the, the moment he's here I want him to understand what his where he's supposed to be going you're supposed to be a man and this is what men do not some point in time where well when does manhood start and like when do I still get to be a child I hear People when they when they mess up, they say, "Well, he's you know he's just a kid, but he's 25." Right? Yeah. <laughs> when, 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 and then and then on the other hand, when someone commits a crime and he's 15, you want to charge him as an adult. Like, yeah. well, which which one is it? So, I'm gonna eliminate the inconsistency. I'm just gonna tell you, I have a man in training, and that's the that's the target is right. to be a man. I love that. I might borrow that. <laughs> Have at it. Have at it. Have at it. Have at it. Well, my goddaughter, we call it, we say woman in training. So she's a wit. She's a wit and he's a mitt. Yeah. So cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because again, you're looking to that North Star. You're not, it's not about now. It's about where we're going. Because every moment we're moving closer to that North Star. So why not focus on it? 
Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, right? You're either going, we're either going closer to it, or we're getting further from from it happening. Exactly. You know, it just made me think of you know, um, I don't know why, but in the Bible, when you know Sarah turned around and you know she became a pillar of salt because she didn't focus on where she was going. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's danger in that, right? There's yeah. no point in looking back. It, as Rafiki says in The Lion King, when he hits Simba on the head, and Simba says, "Ah, oh, what's that for?" He said, "That matter was in the past." That's, so, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness! Awesome. Right. So. Do you have any last words or are we good? No, we're good. Again, okay. I appreciate you for having me and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share. And thank you so much. It has been an absolute honor. I mean, you've just shared so much. I hope people, you know, just really focus and take it in, just really absorb the information that you've shared today because it will help enrich their lives. And I'm going to tell you again, people, NathanielAturner.com, okay? Let him be your mentor. Let him help you through this journey of motherhood, fatherhood, because it takes a village. And, you know, he can be your North Star, one of your starting five. You don't have to be in his presence. You'll be, you know, he, to still get the information from him. So thank you again, Nate. Oh, my Blessings. pleasure. Thank you for having me. Anytime. My pleasure. Thank you.